You can share your thoughts on the Vegas shooting. Yeah. Well, what I would do is recommend the biblical lecture I did on Cain and Abel, I would say, because I think that that's a good summary of the state of mind that somebody has to be in in order to do what was done at Las Vegas. So you have to be very, very embittered by life in order to do that sort of thing. And you have to be searching for revenge, I would say. And it's not, you know, you might think, well, it's only revenge on other people because you've developed hatred for people, but it's deeper than that. It's not just hatred for people. I would say it's hatred for being itself and, and the desire to take revenge on being for the outrage of the tragedy and suffering that's associated with being. Um, and maybe the tragedy and suffering that's been part and parcel of your own life. And that makes you embittered. And then past embittered becomes outraged. And past outraged becomes, well, homicidal or even genocidal. And that's a terrible state of mind to be in. It's a hellish state. Um, I believe that the best way to conceptualize the state of mind that someone has to be in in order to do something like the Columbine shootings, for example, or what happened in Las Vegas is that you're really, and I, you have to speak about it in religious languages, you're really out for revenge against God for the outrage of creation. That's what it looks like to me. And, and that's a state of mind that's truly hellish. And you can get there by brooding long enough. Now, it's also possible, I mean, this guy didn't have any previous history, criminal history or anything like that. And he's pretty old. So, you know, there's also, also also the possibility of some kind of neurological pathology that that might be characteristic of him, you know, some degenerative neurological disease. There was a kid years ago at the University of Texas at Austin who climbed up on the tower there and shot a number of people with a high-powered rifle. And he had a fast-growing tumor on his hypothalamus and had reported like these being overcome with extreme feelings of rage. And so that's another possibility. But I would say the uh, embitterment hypothesis is the strongest one. I would also say, too, I, I noticed that Steven Pinker tweeted this today, is that one of the ways of controlling this sort of thing would be for the press to agree not for there to be a blanket agreement, not to publicize the name or any other identity markers of the people who do the shooting. Because there's also this really, what would you call it, arrogance. It's a kind of arrogance and pride, last ditch arrogance and pride that, that is associated with the fantasies that drive this sort of behavior. And the fantasy is something like, well, after I do this, everyone will sure know the, who, who the hell I was, you know, even though maybe I was ignored or unhappy when I was alive. After I'm dead, everybody's going to know who I was and what I did. And, you know, so there's this underground desire for fame. I guess it's notoriety, but notoriety might be preferable to being ignored. And so, you know, there's a lot of talk about gun control, and that's understandable, especially with regards to automatic rifles. Um, <clears throat> Although I also understand why the people who are gun owners are afraid of, 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 of allowing what they regard as one of their fundamental rights to be infringed upon. Um, but it would certainly be useful if we stop giving people who do this sort of thing a uh, $100 million worth of free publicity and all the notoriety they can manage. So, you know, that's another way of thinking about controlling it. So. One of the things you'll see, if, if, if you're interested in this sort of thing, if you ever go read the writings of, of the Columbine killers, the, the teens, they're very interesting. They're very much worth r reading, especially, I think it's Dylan Klebold, who was the more literate of the, of the two. But he tells you exactly where he went after brooding and brooding and brooding on his, his isolation and segregation from mankind. So he's out there beyond, he's out there in a chaotic domain and because he's tortured by that, his thoughts take an unbelievably dark turn. Like, it's unimaginably dark. Um, if you're interested in that sort of thing, you could read that. There's another book you could read called Panzram, P-A-N-Z-R-A-M. And it's a fascinating book. It's about this guy who, I think he raped 1,200 men. So that sort of tells you what sort of guy he was. Extraordinarily physically powerful and brutal and malevolent. And he was kind of a juvenile delinquent type and they put him in a reform school and he was not well treated in that reform school. It's sort of like the worst of the Canadian residential schools. And when he came out, he was not a happy boy. 
And so he spent the rest of his life trying to be as destructive as he could possibly imagine and purely consciously with malevolent intent. And then, and, and believe me, he was pretty destructive. He kept track of the dollar value of all the buildings he burned down. He tried to start a war between Britain and the United States. Like he was all out for all out mayhem. His dying words that they're gonna hang him. Um, he told the guy who was gonna hang him, to, he said, hurry up you who's your bastard. I could kill 12 men in the time it takes you to hang me. And that's exactly the sort of person he was. And he made friends with this physician in the, in the prison who he thought was like the first person who ever did something nice for him, gave him a dollar for cigarettes, if I remember correctly, and the physician encouraged him to write his autobiography. And so he did, and it's, it's available. And so if you want a view, because you know, you, you always think of people, you think, well, people have good intentions, you know, that you especially think that if you're naive and agreeable. So all of you who are sitting there out there thinking people have good intentions, you're probably high in agreeableness. But that's not always the case. People can have very dark motivations that are fully conscious and very well elaborated. And Panzerab was no, he was smart. And his book is very well written and he tells you exactly why he thought the way he thought. And so it's a good glimpse of exactly this sort of thing where you can get to if you want to by brooding on your specific misfortune. You know, and his, his basic credo was that human beings were so reprehensible that they should just be eliminated. And believe me, that's what he was trying to do. And these people who do terrible things, like the Columbine shooters, that's exactly what, for lack of a better word, they're possessed by. It's sheer malevolence. And the Columbine kids had a much more spectacular catastrophe plan than the one that actually occurred. And they knew it was going to be a full-blown media circus. And lots of these people who engage in those sorts of mass murders, they know about the other mass murderers and they're engaged in a competition. And the competition is who can do the most brutal thing the fastest, something like that. So you can't just be thinking about people who, you know, who have good intentions but have somehow gone wrong. If you ever meet someone who isn't like that and you think that, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. That's sounds pretty optimistic again. But, but again, I think it's a description of the structure of existential reality. And, and by, by which I mean... When I'm in my clinical practice and I observe, and this is also the case with my students, is let's say... People's lives aren't what they would like them to be. And so then you ask, why? Well, forget about tragedy and catastrophe, because that's self-evident, and we're not going to discuss that. Although the degree to which you bring about your own tragedy is always indeterminate. But I would never say that every terrible thing that is visited on a person is something they deserved. I think that that's a very dangerous presupposition especially because everyone gets sick and everyone dies. But one of the main reasons that people don't get what they want is because they don't actually figure out what it is. And the probability that you're going to get what would be good for you, let's say, which would even be better than what you want, right? Because, you know, you might be wrong about what you want easily. But maybe you could get what would really be good for you. Well, why don't you? Well, because you don't try. You don't think, okay, here's what I would like if I could have it. And, and I, don't mean, I don't mean in a way that you manipulate the world to force it to deliver you goods for status or something like that. That isn't what I mean. I mean something like, imagine that you were taking care of yourself like you were someone you actually cared for. And then you thought, okay, I, I'm caring for this person. I would like things to go as well for them as possible. What would their life have to be like in order for that to be the case? Well, people don't do that. They don't sit down and think, all right, you know, let's, let's figure it out. You're, you've got a life. It's hard, obviously. It's like three years from now, you can have what you need. You've got to be careful about it. You can't have everything. You can have what would be good for you. But you have to figure out what it is. And then you have to aim at it. Well, my experience with people has been is if they figure out what it is that would be good for them and then they aim at it, then they get it. And it's strange because they don't, it's a strange thing. It's not quite that simple because 
you know, you may formulate an idea about what would be good for you, and then you take 10 steps towards that, and you find out that your formulation was a bit off, and so you have to reformulate your goal. You know, you're, so you're kind of going like this as you move towards the goal. But a huge part of the reason that people fail is because they don't ever set up the criteria for success. And so since success is a very narrow line and very unlikely, the probability that you're going to stumble on it randomly is zero. And so there's a proposition here, and the proposition is, if you actually want something, you can have it. Now, the question then would be, well, what do you mean by actually want? And the answer is that you reorient your life in every possible way to make the probability that that will occur as certain as possible. And that's a sacrificial idea, right? It's like, you don't get everything. Obviously, you... Obviously, but maybe you can have what you need and maybe all you have to do to get it is ask but the asking isn't a Whim or, or today's wish. It's like you have to be deadly serious about it You have to think okay, like I'm taking stock of myself and if I was going to live properly in the world and I was going to set myself up such that being would justify itself in my estimation, and, and I don't mean as a harsh judge, exactly what is it that I would aim at? Well, one of the things I've found is that, in, in test of this theory, let's say, you could try this. This is a form of prayer, knocking. Sit on your bed one day and ask yourself, uh, what's... What remarkably stupid things am I doing on a regular basis to absolutely screw up my life? 